Hello, you beautiful people. Hello. I have the honor of getting to interrupt this lovely lunch. <laughs> so I, I apologize for that. But we have a very important program in front of us. This is a time when we get to honor the incredible work that you guys are doing um, and find a few amazing examples that we can elevate and say we are in honor of, in awe of the work that you've done. Before we get started, however, I also have the honor of introducing uh, one Mr. Phil Villers, who is Family USA's founder, he is our president, and in truth, he is our guiding, uh, our guiding spirit, our motivator, he is an amazing man. So for more than 37 years, Phil Villers had a vision for creating a social justice movement around healthcare, a belief to create a society in which the best health and healthcare are equally accessible to all. In 1981, he and his phenomenal wife, Kate, founded Families USA. There's so much history there. There were the struggle, struggles of the 80s, the Clinton health reform in the 90s, uh, the creation of the Children's Health Insurance Program, Medicare Part D, CHIP reauthorization, and then, of course, all of the fights to, uh, to uh, enact the Affordable Care Act. And through it all, Phil has been inspiring, he's been pushing, and he's been believing in families. Phil is, in fact, a very big reason why I am here at Families. He is a continuous source of thoughtful and incredibly helpful advice and guidance, combined with a tenacious source of motivation, pushing us to be the most effective organization we can be, both in serving our mission and in the way we, that we deal with each other as colleagues within Families. I'm extremely thankful for Phil's dedication to the success of Families. He has approached me, he has approached me as a new executive director with a great deal of trust, support, and generosity. It is a sincere pleasure for me to welcome Philippe Villers to the, de to the table, or stage. Come on, Phil. Hi, let me uh, first thank Frederick for his kind words. And by the way, I had the pleasure, and it was an enormous pleasure, of being on the search committee which found Frederick. And that's way up in my list of uh, significant contributions to Families USA. Although it was not a one-person committee, but we, we found the right person. Um, Every year, we celebrate some heroes of our movement, our movement for health justice, our movement to protect what we fought so hard to get, and our movement to build on the foundations that the Affordable Care Act provided. And the whole system transformation effort that so many of you are also involved in, both offense and defense, and that's the way it should, it should be. And as you'll see in the presentations, we are in fact a group that stretches the entire country. As you may have noticed in your program, the range of heroes of our movement that we're gonna celebrate in the next few minutes. Ranges from Oregon to Alaska to Maine to Florida and yet also to health equity which as you see we're paying even more attention. So we have a lot to celebrate and uh, Patrick if you'll come up we'll proceed with the awards. Thank you, Phil. 
Our first award goes to someone who is well known to the healthcare advocacy community. Jesse Ellis O'Brien is the policy director for the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group, or OSPERG, as folks in Oregon know it. And there he led efforts uh, to adopt a comprehensive health insurance network adequacy law, and in the last year to enact surprise medical bill legislation. And that's one reason we're honoring Jesse. But we're also honoring him today because of his ability and understanding of the need to focus on the ways to bring affordability and value to the healthcare system. Through Osberg's efforts with the Health Insurance Rate Watch Program, which was established in 2010 and is now led by Jesse, an estimated $280 million have been cut from premiums for people with small businesses in Oregon since 2010. But his reach goes far beyond the Pacific Northwest. Through his work with U.S. PERG and as a consumer representative at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, he is, has a reach that is national in scope. If uh, his co-conspirator and one of his uh, partners on the NIIC Consumer Board, Claire McAndrew, were here today, and believe me, she wishes she was, she would talk about all the ways Jesse has made, made life better for consumers through his incisive, soft-spoken advocacy as a consumer rep in the often Byzantine world of state insurance commissioners and the insurance plans they regulate. He has also shared his expertise with PERG organizations across the country and assisted in other states, including working with advocates recently in California and Maryland in support of successful prescription drug pricing, transparency, and anti-gouging laws. Uh, since Jesse is a uh, native of the Beaver State, it is, it is tempting to say that he is just damn good. But no, no. But, sorry. But it takes commitment, insight, and determination to tackle the healthcare industry and to demand care, value, and affordability for consumers. And for that reason, Jesse is taking on that fight, and that is why we are honored to award him with the Consumer Health Advocate Award for Healthcare Value. Let me introduce Jesse O'Brien. Thanks so much, Patrick, and uh, thanks to all of you. Wow, this is, this is a really big room. Um, it's, this is really uh, one of the greatest honors of my professional career to, to be here and to be uh, given this award in front of my community of, of people. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and uh, I also want to uh, let you all in on uh, something that's actually kind of gone under the radar, which is that um, Oregon voters just gave me the, what I would say is the best possible gift to mark this occasion, which is uh, the passage of um, uh, Ballot Measure 101 to uh, preserve Oregon's uh, Medicaid expansion and the reinsurance program we helped create. Uh, just earlier this week when I was on a, a plane out to come here. So that, that was very exciting. Um, and uh, I'm sure they did it just for me in honor of this award. Um, and uh, as, uh, as those of you who, who know me will know, I, I, I don't usually like talking very much about myself. So I, I'm just going to make a quick call to action uh, for you all and then uh, get down off the stage here. Um, it seems to me that one of the main themes of uh, this wonderful conference this year is that we all feel that we need to get back on offense and uh, actually pushing to make healthcare work better for American consumers. I think everybody in this room can agree that we need to do that. And um, I think that the best place to start doing that is advocacy around healthcare value, uh, cost and quality, uh, the bang for the buck that people are getting for healthcare in this country. And uh, there's, a, there's a few reasons why I think that's the place uh, to start. First of all, um, and I, I know uh, you all know this already, but bear with me for a minute. Uh, just the scope of the problem is staggering. Um, we know that uh, from study after study that about a third of every dollar we spend on healthcare is wasted effectively on something that doesn't improve our health. Um, and if you look at uh, the healthcare sector as a 
part of our economy as a whole that works out to something roughly on the order of a trillion dollars a year that's essentially just thrown in a hole and lit on fire. And I, I think that that's a big problem, uh, not just because it means that consumers across the country are getting ripped off every day, although it means that, and not just that it means that people are getting, uh, you know, going bankrupt and struggling to make ends meet every day, although it means that, but it's also just an enormous waste of human potential. I mean, imagine what we could do with a trillion dollars a year in this country. Uh, it's really just um, astonishing. And uh, you know, that trillion dollars represents a lot of different problems with the system. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it's a, an easy fix by any means, but uh, we need to get working on it. And I, th I think one of the reasons we need to is that uh, this is where people are at. Uh, this is the thing that the American public is most upset about with our healthcare system. This is where, where we can meet people and organize them to make positive change. Um, and I think the American public is expecting us as consumer advocates to be their champs in this fight. Um, and you know, we do need to defend what we have. We need to defend the ACA. Um, and I'm not going to be naive that uh, we're anywhere near out of that fight. I think that fight is going to continue. Um, but I think it's really critical that as we do that, we, we don't be defensive. I think uh, you know, there's a tendency since the ACA has been passed for us to, to feel like we need to defend uh, more than anything else, and therefore we, we, we wind up accidentally seeming as though we're on the side of the status quo, and that is just an absolutely deadly place to be with the way the American healthcare system is failing consumers today. We need to be the champions for improving the value proposition of healthcare in this country. Um, and uh, I would also say I think that um, the sense that people have um, based on the prices of healthcare, that healthcare is effectively a luxury good, <laughs> is uh, not just wrong and, and unacceptable, it's also highly pernicious and it helps, um, it helps, I think, undergird the sense people have that healthcare is a zero-sum game and uh, when somebody else gets it, uh, it means a little bit less for me. Um, so I think we need to be out there calling that out. Um, I mean, it's, it's wrong that it's a zero-sum game, but the fact that it costs so much is a big part of why people feel that way. Um, and then uh, finally, I think the reason we need to, to uh, really lead with a message about healthcare value is just that I think this is something that plays everywhere, that everybody in this country cares about. Um, you know, I, I sometimes get the sense talking to advocates that people feel like I have the luxury of working on these issues because I live in Oregon and we have a, a state culture that's very committed to health reform um, and uh, I am very lucky to be in that position, um, but I do think consumers everywhere in this country want us to be the champions on this issue and uh, this is the place where we can meet people who may disagree with us on a lot of other things, but they agree that we need to do something about the fact that we're just throwing money into a pit and, throw, and uh, setting it on fire. <laughs> um, so in any event, I'm really excited to work with all of you in the years ahead to uh, advance this fight. And um, if there's anything I can do to, to help any of you in your, in your efforts on this, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you so much. Now our next award sticks to the West Coast, but it goes to the last frontier. Following the election, Families USA and other members of the Protect Our Care Coalition identified key states as targets to stop repeal efforts, and Alaska was at the top of the list. After adopting Medicaid expansion under Governor William Walker, the state stood to lose if a repeal or Medicaid block grant program was passed by Congress. Many groups understood the need to educate lawmakers about the importance of Medicaid, but few could take the lead of an advocacy coalition effort in the 49th state. At the critical moment, Trevor Storrs, the executive director of the Alaska Children's Trust, 
agreed to take on the task and lead, organize, convene, and engage a coalition effort that became Protect Our Care Alaska. Through his efforts and the efforts of others in Alaska, much was done to identify the key messages and the key research that was needed to make a strong case against repeal for Senator Lisa Murkowski. Trevor worked with others to convene coalition partners for direct meetings with Murkowski and her staff and to show the strong opposition of Alaskans to Affordable Care Act repeal. If you go to the uh, Protect Our Care Act Alaska uh, homepage, you will see videos of Trevor making statements about the importance of Medicaid and how vital it was. You'll also see pictures of him just the other day meeting with Senator Murkowski and talking to her. So because of his leadership, we are pleased to give Trevor Storrs the Consumer Health Advocate Award for coverage, Trevor Storrs. Well, let's start with two simple words. Senator Murkowski. <laughs> Who thought? Actually, we did. Uh, she has been a great champion. I know she doesn't always agree with us or us with her, but really do want to do a shout out. She has been a champion, not just for Alaska, but for our nation. I really appreciate the recognition given today, and it makes me reflect on the past year and how it reminds me of the Diderot. Who here knows about the great last race. Only a few hands. It is a dog sled race, 352 miles from Anchorage, Alaska, all the way to Nome. And like the past year, mushers, our advocates, were faced with unbelievable challenges. On that race, they're facing minus 30. If you think this 30 degrees is cold, add a minus and then add the wind chill. There's a reason why the guys all have beards and it's all frosty. <laughs> They're going without any sleep. This race takes eight to 15 days. They're going full tilt for eight to 15 days. Do you all remember those, DEFCON 5? We've all went through that. And then navigating by instinct. There's no markers. It's not like running a marathon where they have mile posts. You need to figure it out. But most of all, that musher, myself, was just one part of a team. I appreciate the recognition today, but this is really about that team. There's 16 essential members in front of that dog sled that we're trying to get over that line, the finish line. They are going. They are working in sync, and they are flying. And as the musher, you're literally either holding on for dear life, or you're literally running behind them trying to keep up with 16 dogs. Has your dog ever run away from you and you try to chase it? You can never catch it. So imagine being behind 16 of them trying to keep up. I gave up trying to keep up. I just let that team go and I held on for dear life. So today, I accept this award not for the work that I did, but truly for the partners and the team of Protector Care Alaska. Without them, we would not have been able to say those two simple words, Senator Murkowski. And I look forward to working with them over the next year, over the next decade, and making sure that we have health care for everyone. And now our next award presenter, Sophia Tripoli from Families USA. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very excited and extremely honored to presenting our next advocate, Consumer Advocate uh, of the Year Award to Jenny Perkle from the Maine, uh, Maine People's Alliance for her incredible work uh, leading the campaign efforts for the Maine Medicaid Expansion Ballot Initiative, which won a resounding victory this past November to expand coverage to 70,000 Mainers. Jenny Perkle started her career as a Masters of Social Work intern, working closely with the organizers of the Maine People's Alliance to convince Senator Collins and Snow to vote to pass the Affordable Care Act. She was officially hired on March 23, 2010, the same day the ACA was signed into law. And, has she, and she has been, or, or was, the statewide healthcare organizer at Maine People's Alliance for the past seven years. This past year, Jenny served as a campaign manager for Maine's healthcare, Mainers for Healthcare, the campaign that made Maine the first state to successfully pass Medicaid expansion at the ballot. For Jenny, like for too many people in our country, lack of access to healthcare is personal. Before the Affordable Care Act was passed, she was a young invincible, working multiple jobs with no insurance. She got sick and racked up medical debt, getting firsthand experience with how devastating the holes in our healthcare system can be. She is proud to have worked with a fantastic team of coworkers at Maine People's Alliance and coalition partners in Maine and across the country to close the gap and will continue working to improve our systems so they work for everyone. Jenny Perkle is a true organizer. This past week, she was promoted to be the organizing director of the Maine People's Alliance and of course, is our next Consumer Healthcare Advocate Award for coverage. Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be recognized by Families USA and to be here among all of you who are doing such amazing work to improve our healthcare systems. Let me tell you a little bit about Maine. In 2010, for the first time in more than 30 years, Republicans gained control of the House, the Senate, and we got Governor LePage, the guy who's been described as Trump before Trump. So we've been fighting this fight long before 2016, and we, and we at Maine People's Alliance have learned that the best defense is a good offense, and that if we only put our energy into just preserving what we already had, we are going to lose. We learned that by running campaigns to push bold, progressive ideas, we could not only hold the line, but we could actually win meaningful change. There have certainly been some really hard losses over the past eight years. But even with Governor LePage, Maine has successfully used the ballot initiative process to make direct, significant changes in people's lives. We raised the minimum wage. We increased funding for education. We even legalized pot. <laughs> Because of these wins, last year our state budget fight was about how to fund education instead of how to cut it. And it was about how much the minimum wage, minimum wage should change, not if it should at all. The referendum campaigns have given the people of Maine a direct voice and they sent a clear message. So after winning education funding and minimum wage increases, we had a model that we could use to expand Medicaid. We passed Medicaid through the legislature five times, and our governor vetoed it five times, and we came within two or three votes of being able to overturn that veto five times. So we decided to take things directly to the voters. We collected more than 60,000 signatures in one day on election day in 2016, the same day that Trump got elected. And people were coming up to us asking to sign the petition with their Make America Great Again hats because they need health care and their families need health care. Our original plan was to use those signatures as leverage to convince the legislature to do the right thing. And if they failed again, we'd put it on the ballot for this year, 2018. But then we heard the results of the election and we quickly decided that we couldn't wait. Now, some said the ACA would be repealed and we needed to focus solely on defense. Some said ballot campaigns are too risky, but we submitted our signatures anyway. Why? 
We knew it was the only way to ensure that we had a vehicle for talking about the need and desire of real people to have more access to health care, while politicians in DC and the State House were trying to take it away. We knew that having this on the ballot would put pressure on our federal, de federal delegation, Senator Collins in particular, to think twice before taking her vote on the ACA repeal. And we knew that taking this issue straight to the voters would allow us to have value-based conversations with a broad cut of the electorate and an opportunity, opportunity to do it in our frame and on our terms. Senator Booker said yesterday that change doesn't come from Washington, it comes to Washington. And some of the biggest policy changes in our nation start from small campaigns. States, sometimes with help from national partners like Families and the Fairness Project and others, need to lead the way. Since Election Day, I've gotten calls from activists and organizers in Utah, Idaho, Montana, and Nebraska. They saw 252,000 Mainers show up in an off-cycle election and vote for health care for 70,000 of their neighbors and their thinking, how can we run similar campaigns in our states? And even Florida might ask us to come and knock on doors in 2020. <clears throat> but even more importantly, we proved that the people are with us, that healthcare is a human right, and that we should keep pushing until we have full universal coverage. Thank you again, and I look forward to continuing to fight with all of you. Now I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Where is she? Cincy Hernandez Cancio. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, y buen provecho, and that doesn't really have a translation in English. <laughs> um, I am so incredibly excited to be here today uh, to give the Health Equity Consumer Advocate of the Year Award to, where did she go? She's supposed to be here. Uh, to, to Keisha Everett of Health Equity Solutions in Connecticut. Takesha and I go way back. I think we figured out that we met in 2005 when we both worked at SEIU. And I remember that one of the, uh, one of the government affairs uh, leaders kept telling me, there's this woman that you have to meet. You're gonna love her so much. You guys are so alike. You have so much in common. You have to meet Takesha. And I met Takesha and you know, she may not have been right about a lot of things, but she was definitely right about that. <laughs> and uh, over time, we ended up creating this kind of little cabal at SEIU. Uh, her, me, and Khaled Pitts, if you're DC, you might know uh, who he is, who are the, basically the only people in SEIU who are really, really focused on addressing racial and ethnic health disparities. Ironic considering that most of our members were people who are from these disparity groups. But you know, we worked behind the scenes and in little meetings and trying to figure out the ways that we could address this most head on. So she has been, she has been a dedicated advocate to health equity issues for her entire career. And from there, when she went to the Diabetes Association, which as you know, you may know, diabetes is, has an enormous uh, disparate impact on African Americans. Um, and then, I would have never guessed, but she actually left DC, something that none of us thought she would ever do, to go and be the first executive director of an organization that was created exclusively to advocate for health equity, called Health Equity Solutions in Connecticut. 
And I remember, actually, I gave her a call and said, they're looking for an executive director in Connecticut, and I don't want to move. I think this would be great for you. And at first she was like, Connecticut, really? <laughs> um, but it's such a great thing that she ended up there because this year, well not this year, last year, they had an incredible achievement. And we all know, as we heard yesterday, that so much of the issues around health equity are often like not forefront in a lot of the issues around payment and delivery reform. And Connecticut was prioritizing health equity in their SIM payment and delivery reform work. And it gave them the opportunity, gave Takesha the opportunity to support trying to get community health workers who are so critical to addressing social determinants and disparities, more recognition in the state. And they passed that legislation because of her leadership and her ability to bring together coalitions in Connecticut. So I give you the most excellent, fantastic Dr. Takesha Everett. All right, so we are in the Golden Globe, Oscars, Emmy, Grammy time of the year. And um, after years and years of watching those shows, I've learned the secret formula to giving an acceptance speech. You thank God first. <laughs> say something about the award and what it means to you, or perhaps be a little bit deferential and say, I don't know why I got the award. There were so many other great people who should have gotten it. And then you quickly move through your thank yous before your time runs out and before people get bored. So since this is my Golden Globe, Oscar, and Grammy moment of the year, here goes. I'm gonna start with my thank yous because many of you heard, I'm a Southerner, we gratitude first. First I give honor to God who's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of my life and I am all things through the strength of that higher power. I cannot thank everyone that I wanna thank by name because well, we'd be here until the conference ended. But I wanna thank people by groups who are represented by the guests I invited today. I first want to thank my supporters, funders, and advisors represented by the Connecticut Health Foundation and my colleagues from the state of Connecticut who are sitting at my table and who each laid, laid the pathway in and around Connecticut for this health equity work to be done, and for that I am grateful. I thank my friends and colleagues who fight every day to transform our society into one that is more just and more equitable, represented by my friends Cincy, Darren, Daniel, who are all seated at my table today. And here's the funny thing. We all knew each other when, and you can finish that sentence with any dot, dot, dot you want. We can fill in the blank by saying we knew each other when we weren't the people who were on this stage making this conference, having these awards or having the conversation we had on this stage yesterday, but we're rather the first time people who came to this event. I wanna thank each of you for being my friends who answer my crazy texts, analyzing the root causes of healthcare inequities and asking questions like, what about social determinants of health and how do we explain it? I thank you for being the person who randomly helps me recharge by going on trips randomly to Ireland right before Barack Obama is, is um, <laughs> elected and I'm making me miss the inaugural ball because we get stuck in Philadelphia, but nonetheless had a fabulous time and gave me the opportunity to really recharge and come back to this work more vigilant. And I thank you for being the person who answers my call and actually put people to action when I said, where are the people today in this ACA discussion who are talking about health equity when we were doing this work so long ago? I also am thankful for my family, represented here by my Aunt Rosalind and my honorary Aunt Lees. They represent the people I must give the highest level of gratitude and thanks to, because with them I am nothing. They represent my mom and my dad, who preceded me to their final resting place, but gave me the strength, courage, and wisdom to unapologetically be who I am fully and every day be that woman. There isn't a day that goes by that I'm not reminded that none of this would be possible without them. And speaking of possible, this is my quick message to you. Two weeks ago, my team and I embarked on a team building excursion that was supposed to occur in December, but you just heard I moved to Connecticut, so we got snowed out of doing it and had to do it in January, because there was a lot of snow. 
The facilitator opened the day by explaining what we were going to do and said we had to start with an icebreaker getting to know each other better, and that icebreaker was two truths and a lie. Many of you have done this before. Each of us had to come up with two truths and a lie, and while I was trying to figure out what to say, I finally decided what I wanted to say. I wrote it down, and I shared my two truths and my lie. My one, I've been to all but one continent. Two, I've hung out with Idris Elba. Three, I've written poetry for Nikki Giovanni. See me after if you'd like to know which one is the lie. <laughs> my team started to ponder which was the lie, and Claudine, who's the program manager on my team, said, you know, Takesha, I don't know. This is hard, because anything is possible when it comes to you. While I sat there trying to, while they sat there trying to continue to figure this out, I started to ponder this phrase that I'd heard before, of course, we've all heard anything is possible, but was struck by how meaningful it was to me. Anything is possible. It's not that I hadn't heard those words, but it had such a profound effect. And so today I share with you, anything is possible. Some of us in this room are beaten down by the urgency of now and what's happening right now, our political environment, our personal circumstance. We feel overwhelmed by the fight that we must wake up every day. We vacillate between hope and despair, grief and joy, reality and dreams. But I share with you today, anything is possible. I'm a former Medicaid recipient, a mediocre high school academic who earned her PhD from American University doubting every day that I could ever apply sociological theory. Every day I doubted it. But anything is possible. Almost three years ago, I packed up everything I owned, moved to a state where I knew four total people, none of them family, and did not know them well, had no connections to the policy scene, the political scene. I only understood the state legislative process from the states that I had lived in and been in and the federal level. I knew no one in the policy, in the political um, scenario, and was told I would have difficulties because I didn't know anybody, that I was an unknown, that there were people who had tried this before, that we have failed at this before. But in anything is possible. Shortly after I moved, <laughs> shortly after I moved to the state, the political dynamics in the state changed as well as the nation. We all know what that looks like. Making many of us wonder how could we possibly advance anything centered on health equity in this outwardly visceral, racially contentious environment, but anything is possible. Strategically thinking through what could do be done related to health equity and what progress we could look, what progress would look like, and working with a cast of individuals and organizations passionate about health equity, we managed to pass legislation statutorily defining community health workers using a definition crafted in part by community health workers. I stand here telling you this was our first full operational year and our first legislative effort. Anything is possible. I shared these points among the many that I could share because I want you to leave here today understanding that no one man, and he will be unnamed, and no gang of men, and they will be unnamed, can stop this show. Anything we want to do is possible if we remain strong, stay focused, and stay together. Equity is possible. Our circumstances can inform us, but they do not need to define us. Anything is possible. Equity is possible. Thank you, Families USA, for this esteemed honor. I am humbled and I am reminded in every moment as I accept this award that anything is possible. Thank you. Now I'd like to call up our next presenter, um, and we will say that former Families USA staffer and the head of, I forget the name of the organization, but that the a sisters organization, the new national sisters organization, Heather Howard. I'm sorry, Heather Howard. I made a mistake, Heather Booth, sorry. 
It's okay, Cincy. That was a really tough act to follow. Wow, I need that recording, and I want to play it every single day. Thank you, and thank you to all of the presenters and the awardees and the, all of you in this room who I know, yes, we are fatigued, and yes, we're right there with you, but we also know how important this is and how so far from done we are. Um, so with that, it's my distinct privilege, and by the way, I'm Heather Bates, director of the new National Association of Health Access Assisters. We are a project out of California, out of the California Coverage and Health Initiatives, who are also here today, so California folks. Um, and thank you for adopting us and giving us a home. But I do want to just say, for the record, it's Naha. <laughs> In case anyone's wondering if it's Naha'a or Naha, um, we're going to stick with Naha. Uh, but we do like Hawaiian, so mahalo. So it's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce the Consumer Engagement Advocate of the Year Award to Miss Jody Ray, Program Director of Florida's Covering Kids and Families, a statewide navigator program based out of the University of South Florida. Jody oversees the largest federally facilitated statewide navigator program in the country, actually. And it's her staff and her team and the partners in Florida and her, and as is the case across the country, that have a direct impact on the number of people who enroll in coverage, use and understand their coverage, access healthcare services, and stay covered throughout the year. Amen to that. You've all heard the numbers in Florida. We don't need to repeat them. We know they were outstanding, but we also know the enrollment numbers across the country, thanks to all of you, assisters in the room, for all the work you did in 45 days. That's six Saturdays. Let's be clear, Charles Geba. Tweet that. Um, that this was accomplished in a fraction of the time. So. Wow, anything is possible. For those of you who do not know the total responsibility of navigators and certified application counselors, health centers, primary care associations, and all of the nonprofits and community-based orgs that support consumer assistance, the list of these responsibilities is as long as our hearts are compassionate about social justice. Jody is a founding member and steering committee of NAHA and Many of us in the room, my friends at that table, are also, uh, have been involved with making this happen for the last two years. We met on weekends and nights, and here we are. And I would just like to give a shout out to the steering committee that is also here representing Nahan, supporting Jody and her family. Um, but the job responsibilities of programs like Jody's and others may be familiar to all of us in this room, but just so we're crystal clear for the record, these responsibilities will never go away. So thank you, Jody, and thank you, Florida Partners and Health Access Assisters in this room for all the work you've been doing over the course of the past five open enrollment periods, and there will be a sixth. I just want to add a couple of things. I know I'm over time. Sorry, Patrick. Um, but one thing that I did was I surveyed all of those closest to Jody and said, please use one word to describe Jody's work. So the list is a fabulous list, and I actually think that it pertains to all of us. So take careful notes, because I think these will be the words that drive us this year. Creative, passionate, dynamic, loyal, brilliant, determined, persistent, outspoken, fierce, driving force, two words, tenacious, accountable, and my favorite, sassy. <laughs> Jody's body of work demonstrates the great lengths that she will go to help others in need. There are so many accolades. It would really take me until tomorrow at midnight to go through them all, but I just want to highlight a couple. In the recent past, she introduced President Obama on a national teleconference call. Yes, she did. <laughs> Sorry, I had to mention that. Uh, she also presented on C-SPAN about the critical importance of consumer assistance and the importance of navigators and the role that in-person assisters play. 
She also attended many town halls despite orders, mysterious orders to congressional members to not have them. She actually had them with her congresswoman, Castor in Florida, Kathy Castor. Um, oh, there was that time also that she befriended the former First Lady and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and then walked away with a selfie to prove it. And did I also mention that she's getting her doctorate in public health practice? But as I know many of you want to hear from Jody, I'll just end with this. How many of us are Game of Thrones fans in the room? Well, we know that Jody is a big Game of Thrones fan, and we also know that this 2018 election, winter is coming. <laughs> so with that, Jody Ray, it's a privilege. Thank you, Heather, and Mr. Villers, and Families USA for this honor. I would also like to thank my family for joining me today. It is a huge honor for me to receive this award for consumer engagement, and I'm so grateful for this high recognition of the work that I have done. But I'm more than aware that I haven't done it alone. Countless individuals across the country deserve to be distinguished for what has been accomplished to help numerous individuals access health care. While I really appreciate having my efforts recognized, if it wasn't for the collective work of enrollment of sisters and other healthcare sisters, so many individuals would be unable to navigate our current healthcare system and obtain the healthcare they not only need but deserve. The journey to this award has been long and challenging and yet so rewarding. Over the course of the last 20 years that I've been doing this work, I have seen the role of community enrollment assisters grow from a good idea to becoming absolutely necessary. Giving this idea life in a state like Florida has been no small feat. Thank goodness for wine. <laughs> and if nothing else, I do not like to be called or told no. The importance of the work of striving to ease the lives of millions of individuals has been the most powerful incentive and the driving force leading to impressive results. All of this would not have been possible without the coordinated work of a t determined and skillful team that collaborated in order to overcome many barriers and to change lives along the way. I recall in Florida, when Florida decided to close enrollment for our CHIP program, and we disenrolled over 300,000 kids from coverage and determined that if a parent wanted the child insured, then they needed to apply to get on a wait list to see if a slot opened up. It was time to fight. I reached out to every partner I knew across the state, spoke with editorial boards, community coalitions, and even the national press. We told everyone to apply because, after all, no child could be considered for coverage till they got on the wait list. We built up a wait list of over 120,000 kids. The pressure ultimately pushed the state to review those kiddos for coverage. And while, <laughs> while that was not the end of the fight, it showed just how powerful enrollment assistance can be in moving the mountain. It is this resolve and determination that keeps all of us doing this work. We do this because it's so damn important, and it's up to all of us to make sure that that is understood. We know this is not seasonal work. We don't do this once a year. Our jobs are not singularly focused on only helping people apply for coverage. We provide so much more to our consumers and their families. Just because services are available and just because they now have coverage does not mean they just wave their card and walk in, in the door. Our job is to help them understand coverage and care and navigate the complex system of health that we have in this country. Without us, many people would not know what picking a provider means. Without us on the ground, most indi individuals would not have a place to find out why they just lost their tax credits and why their premiums doubled. And without people they trust, like health access assisters, many people would not understand the scope of preventive services that they now have access to and what to do when they find out the whole family 
now has different provider networks because some are on Medicaid, some are on CHIP, and some are in the marketplace. We are here to make this system work for people, many of whom have never accessed care through insurance ever before. We help them understand it so they can use it and value it and make it work for them. Yes, we do that every single day, not for the awards or the recognition, because we are passionate and compassionate individuals, and we know that consumer assistance is a glue that bonds together coverage to care for millions of Americans. I appreciate this award because it represents recognition of just how significant this is to healthcare models effectiveness. As we are looking toward the future, any vision for healthcare models need to include consumer engagement at its core. Without consumer assistance, those models will fail to be effective. Leaving this piece out of the equation going forward will be short-sighted and fruitless. I would like to express my deep gratitude to the members of the Florida Covering Kids and Families team who have worked so diligently to help so many people across the state of Florida. It is an honor to, for me to lead such a dedicated and highly devoted team. I can't begin to express how grateful I am that Families USA recognizes the value and the importance of consumer assistance and the tireless work that we do. Thank you. Let me just add a postscript to what you've just been hearing. We've all heard the term, the wreckers are coming. They've come from Washington, and we've seen some of the ways in which we are successfully fighting back. It's important. Thank you, Phil. Could we have each of our award winners stand up and get one final recognition for their work. Thank you. So we're about to wrap up lunch, which means we will be beginning another round of workshops, which will begin at 2 o'clock. I do want to talk briefly about tomorrow morning when we will have our uh, breakfast roundtable caucuses. If you want to learn more about States like Maine and ballot initiatives, there's going to be a roundtable that will talk about that, um, that will include uh, Matt Sloniker from, from Utah. So we'll be having that. There will also be roundtables around Medicaid waivers. Uh, there will be a roundtable uh, regarding assisters and also on managed care. Um, I also want to add that there is another caucus that is meeting this evening uh, in the Thornton Room here at the hotel. That is the California caucus. That caucus has its own, its own way of uh, caucusing, which will be um, special. And, uh, and so they will be having their own uh, California caucus in the Thornton Room, so that is coming up. Finally, a plug, there is a 5K that I will run tomorrow, beginning at 7.30. If anybody wants to join me, please join me in the lobby. Uh, that'll be at 7.30 tomorrow morning. So uh, get to your workshops, they begin at two o'clock. We will be back in this room at 3.45 for the final plenary of the day. And so I uh, look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. <laughs>